Good evening and welcome to this walk through Italian poetry, beginning with Dante and ending with contemporary poetry today. Our first presenter will be Jose Caceres, who is going to begin from the depths of hell. So I'm going to be reciting Canto 33 from the Inferno. Uh, it takes place in the ninth circle of hell, where the traitors are punished, buried up to their necks in ice. And this one is about the Count Ugolino, who's eating at the back of the head of the Archbishop Ruggieri, who uh, betrayed him, just as he had betrayed his party. So they're two members of two competing factions in Italy at the time. And for Dante, betraying your party, your kin, your country, was the worst thing that you could do, and that's why they're found at the bottom of hell. So this begins right when the Count Ugolino realizes that the door to the dungeon that he and his four sons are in is being locked, and that they will not make it out. Ya eran desti, el lora se apresaba, que el chivo me solea ese de adopto, que per su sonio chascun dubitaba. Io senti che aver luce di sotto all'orribile torre, con io guardai nel viso a mia figuori senza far moto. Io non piangea, sì dentro mi petrai, piangeva nel e anzi il mucio mio disse, tu guardi sì padre, che hai? Perciò non lacrimai, ne risposi io, tutto quel giorno, nella notte appresso, finché l'altro sol nel mondo uscio. Come un poco di raggio si fu messo nel doloroso carcere e io scorsi per quattro visi il mio aspetto stesso, amo le man per lo dolor mi morsi, ed ei pensando che lo fessi per voglia di manicar di subito le orsi, e di ser padre assai ci fiamendoia se tu mangi di noi, tu ne vestisti queste misere carni e tu le spoglia. Quetami allor per non farli più tristi, lo dri, lo di e l'altro stemmo tutti inutili. Ai dura terra, perché non t'apristi? Poscia che fumo al quarto divenuti, gado mi sigitò disteso ai piedi, dicendo, padre mio, che non mi aiuti? Qui vi morì, e come tu mi vedi, vidi io cascarli tre ad uno ad uno, tra il quinto di e il sesto, non io mi diedi, già cieco a brancolar sopra ciascuno, e due di chiamai poi che fur morti. Poscia, più che il dolore, potè di giuno. To make our walk through Italian poetry complete, I decided to insert a poem from the Italian Renaissance, because we're beginning with Dante and adding, ending with contemporary poetry. So choosing a poem from the Renaissance is more or less impossible, because it's such a complex and rich phenomenon. But in the Renaissance, there was a mad fashion of imitating Petrarch. Everybody was imitating Petrarch's poetry, and this was happening in Spain, in France, in England, all over Europe, and all over Italy. And among all these mad imitators of Petrarch were women, women poets. Um, and it's the first time that women poets entered the formal Italian poetry canon and wrote about not only love, but also one of Petrarch's fundamental themes, which is the conflict between reason and desire. So that's really one of the main accomplishments of Petrarch. This is a, a very famous fresco, which is now in Rome, in uh, the Villa Farnesina, which shows the myth of Procris and uh, Cephalus. Um, they are two lovers, and he accidentally kills her. So um, the poem I'm going to read by Chiara Matraini um, is probably taking this myth, taking Virgil's myth and Petrarch and making it into her own very original dialogue about inner torment. Okay. 
So I'll read first an English version of it, um, and then I'll recite the Italian original. Wild creature I am, trapped in this obscure place, who goes with arrow driven through my heart. Consumed, I flee the torment I embrace. I seek the one who dared to cast the dart. And like the bird that sets itself on fire, will feel within each feather burning stings, takes off from its warm nest to soar up higher, to flee the flames it lights with flapping wings. I do the same through summer's open doors. Desire's bright wings squire me to blue vaults. I soar and flame is blazing with my flight. But as I fly from each and every shore, away from this vine, I launch a fierce assault, a long enduring death against a short life. Here is the Italian original of Chiara Matraini. Fera son io di questo umbroso loco, che volgo una saeta in mezzo al core, fuggendo lassa il fin del mio dolore, e cerco chi mi strugge a poco a poco. E come un gel che fra le penne il fuoco si sente acceso, onde volando fuori dal dolce viso suo, mentre l'ardore fugge con l'ale più che accende il fuoco. Tanio, fra queste fronde all'aura estiva, con l'ali del desio volando in alto, cerco il fuoco fuggir che mi porto. Ma quando vado più di riva in riva per fuggirmi o male, con fiero assalto, lunga morte, procaccio al viver corso. next presenter, we're going to fast forward to the Italian unification period, uh, or what we call Risorgimento, is Tonietta Gianni, and she is going to recite from Giovanni Pascoli's Milice. Tonietta? So, as she announced, I will be doing Il Dampo and Il Tuono by Giovanni Pascoli. Giovanni Pascoli, as an author, as a poet, as a writer, really stood out to me because he lost both, both of his parents by the age of 14, and then he later lost about five siblings by the time he reached his adulthood. Now, death is something that we humans really struggle with. We have a hard time dealing with death, and the fact that he was able to deal with all those deaths and make poetry and do something beautiful is really inspiring to me. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to pick him. The two, that, the two poems that I will be reciting today are both nature poems. I also really like this aspect to Pasquale that he has a lot of nature poems. And I really love the rhythm of these two poems, especially in the second one. And I'll go through those a little bit later. Um, if you don't mind, thank you. Il Lampo, the lightning. Cielo e terra si sbrocca nera, la terra ansante vivi dai in suo smutto, il cielo è gonfio, tragico di spatto, bianca bianca nel tacito tonto, una cassa parì, sparì, d'un tratto, come un occhio che largo e sterebato, sapri si chiuse nella notte nera. Il tuono è padre. Nella notte nera, come nulla, a un tratto col fragor l'arduo di rumbo, che fra il tuono rimbombò di schiatto, rimbombò, rimbalzò, rotolò cupo, tacque. Poi rimareggiò di rifratto e poi vanì. Suove allora un canto su di di madre e il moto di una vita. So since I do not have a translation, translation, I will just go almost verse by verse and try to kind of just explain what he's saying. So in the first one, he starts off by saying, the sky and the earth show you who they truly were. And he gives the sky and the earth human characteristics. He says that the earth was angry, livid, and in shock. He goes in by saying the sky was tragic and just did this huge mess. So he's kind of setting up what the earth is like when a storm hits. 
And then he starts to talk about what he, what you see when a storm hits. So you see white, white flashes. It's not just a white flash. You see it in doubles. So he has Bianca, Bianca, white, white. And then he talks about how you see a house suddenly appear and then disappear. And then he uses a simile and compares this concept to an eye opening up and being in shock and so enlarged and then closing all of a sudden. And then he ends by saying, Nella notte nera, in the dark night. Now what I really like about these two poems is though, as though they are, although they are two different poems, you can tell that the second one is a continuation of the first one because the first one ends, Nella notte nera, in the dark night, and the second one starts up again in the dark night. So it goes, in Nella notte nera, and in the dark night. So it's a continuation. So he goes, in Nella notte nera, come in nulla, in the dark nothingness. He talks about a cliff like crumbling. And then what I really find beautiful is this line right here, il tuono rimbombo di schianto. So this is very beautiful because he uses an automatopoeia. He's not only saying what happens, he's you can hear it in the sound, which I think is very beautiful and very difficult to do when you translate. So rimbombo di schianto, so the rumbling of the of the slash almost like this. Yes. And then rimbombo, rimbozzo, rotolo cupo. So he's making these sounds of the thunder. And then this is, and then he goes on by saying, and then silence. So all this noise, all this ruckus, and then silence. And then it starts up again. And then silence. So it's this continuing of, of noise and then silence, noise and then silence. And then what I really love about the last sentence is that. It's, it's very different from the first one. So the first one's very intense, very flavorful almost. It's very, very strong. Whereas the second one is a switch and it starts to become more sweet. And he talks about the soothing song of a mother's lullaby to her, to her child who's rocking back and forth and sleeping. Um, so I think that's very, very beautiful how he was able to have this huge com commotion and then go to a really soft and tranquil scene. So, thank you. So our next presenter is going to read a poem by Dino Campana from his Canti Orfici. Campana is a very unique poem, uh, poet in the sort of gallery of Italian poetry. He doesn't really belong to any particular movement. So, Chad Perebia. So yeah, what she said, we are reciting Parte Bote, which is simply a poem about uh, a man walking on a pier during the night by the ocean. And it was a favorite poem for me because of the rhyme, rhyme scheme and the rhythm and um, the imagery you get from it. And I think it was a favorite among our poetry class as well. And um, yeah. Parte bote nella nave che si scorte con le navi che procorte di una ora sulla fora spende un occhio incandescente con il passo solitario deve l'ombra per che nella luce uniforme tra le navi alla città solo lo passo che alla notte Solitario, si propone per la notte. Tali navi, solitario, si propone così bassa, così ambigua. Per la notte, così pura. L'acqua del mare che è nella sala, alle rotte, nella notte, parte, cerco, per le rotte, dentro l'occhio. Di su mano, de la notte, di un destino, de la notte, più lontano, per le rotte, de la notte, il mio passo, parte forte. Grazie. Our next presenter is Holly Sino, and she's going to uh, 
translate and recite a poem from Giuseppe Ungaretti's Il Porto Sepolto, La Notte Bella. Holly? Um, so I chose to study the work of Ungaretti because I found it very inspiring um, that he was a soldier in World War I and started developing his poetry, um, developing his style, writing his poetry while he was in the trenches fighting the war. Um, and I just found it really beautiful that he could look for something bigger, um, some beauty in the tragedy and the terrible things that were surrounding him while he was fighting. Um, specifically in the poem, La Notte Bella, The Beautiful Night, um, Ungaretti is taking this look at the sky, marveling in the beauty that he sees in the sky. Um, but in a deeper sense, he's realizing that he's part of something greater than himself. And um, I chose this picture, La Madonna Lita, um, because uh, it's a common theme in Ungaretti's work is that of innocence. And so you'll see in the poem, Ungaretti says, Come un bambino la mamella, like a baby at the breast. Um, so he uses this theme of innocence, vulnerability to approach this idea that he's part of something greater than himself and he's um, taking in all this beauty that's in the world. The Beautiful Night. What song rises this night that intertwines the stars with the crystal echo of the heart? What rising celebration from heart to nuptials? I was a pool of darkness. Now I bite like a baby at the breast, space. Now I am drunk on universe. La notte bella. Quale canto se levato stanotte? Che intesse? Di cristallina ecco del cuore. Le stelle. Quale festa sorgiva? Di cuore a nozze. Sono stato uno stagno di buio. Ora mordo. Come un bambino la mamella, lo spazio. Ora sono ubriaco d'universo. Our next presentation will be by Rita Flores, who is bringing us into the contemporary time. And she is going to recite, to read and recite a poem by Rodolfo Di Biasio titled Patmos. I selected the poem Patmos to read because of its connection to Homer's The Odyssey. Both pieces address the conflict between how the external may or may not affect our internal experiences, which ultimately shape us, shape us. In the poem Patmos, we have a character who feels deep despair, and through his despair, he ultimately finds wisdom. This character, much like Homer's Odysseus, is searching for happiness. To find happiness, Odysseus has to overcome many challenges. Odysseus, who is the hero of our story, possesses intelligence like that of the gods. But his major fault is in being human. To be human is to err in judgment, and throughout the Odyssey, Odysseus errs in judgment. His bad judgments caused his shipmates to drown at sea and left him half dead on a deserted island where Calypso the nymph makes him her captive. It is here we feel Odysseus's pain and anguish. Calypso finds Odysseus sitting upon the beach with his eyes ever filled with tears and dying of sheer homesickness. For he has got tired of Calypso, and as for the daytime, he spent it on the rocks and on the seashore weeping, crying out loud for his despair. Like the character in Patmos, Odysseus is surrounded by beauty, the island, and the goddess who provides for him. But he does not see anything beneath its lustrous surface and wants to be happy. The rumbling sea and Poseidon's wrath is what keeps both characters from their ultimate journey to happiness. 
Paskimus begins with a man sitting on a cliff of an island, listening to the waves, arching tall, and leveling out again. Slowly, his anxiety begins to unfold before us. And now I'll read um, Patmos by Rodolfo de Biasio. En un rombo, en un rombo solo, esta cera qui pare o scrito, con la mano dentro e del sorso di cicuta, avverto di aver disimparato la sua voce, vuole altri ascolti, la voce di questo mare vuole i silenzi dell'anima, anche quando come stasera si fa rombo sulla spogliera, vuole solitudini che più non abbiamo e che forse toccherà ritrovare al marinaio delle stelle 